very good morning to all of you. Uh, may I ask how many of you here are a data scientist or analyst building machine learning models? Hmm. So quite a few of you, right? So I think you can relate to my story. Like a few years back when I started with data science, you are super excited, right? You want to build stuff and like, yeah, this is the magic. And uh, you go, you clean your messy data, create some good features, put into your like fancy algorithm and get a pretty good result on the test data and you're like very happy, right? And my and I think you can guess that happiness was a bit short lived because as soon as I like showed it to the business, I went to a fancy meeting feeling very happy about myself, put the model, put the accuracy, everything. I was like, they're gonna love me. And the one thing which I got from them was how does your model works? I'm like Damn, that's right. I'm like, I'm not gonna explain them how Exiboost works. I'm like, shit. So this question, this question hit me and I was like, Yo, I need to think and I, I need to think why people ask these questions, like why we get this question. So if we have to, like the very obvious reason would be this, right? It's not magic, it's science. So there has to be explanation for it. So. Yeah, but uh, the good thing about being a human being is that we don't accept fact the way it is, right? We like to reason, we like to think why it happened. And at least most of us do, right? So we need to know why these things are happening. So, um, I mean, the need for interpreting a model actually arises from the most important part is trust. If the business is not going to trust your model, they're not going to use it, right? Because they are driving business decision with it. So building a trust in your model is very important. And you can build trust when you can explain how they are making those decisions. And the other point would be, which is very important, I can't stress this enough, is our ethical obligation. You must be reading a lot of articles in news right now that some of the models are biased toward race or a gender or anything. Because models are very objective, and we as a people, I think it was talked even in the first talk, right? We, we could feed data which would make the model biased, and it's, it's very important that we understand how the model is making those decisions. And this is really important in like medical system or a judiciary system, or you don't want to reject somebody's loan just because their PIN code is from a low-income area, right? So you need to understand how your model works, and yeah, Beca uh, and then the next point which would be useful as a data scientist for you is feature engineering. We all know that we spend most of our time doing feature engineering. So if we can understand how each feature is used in our model or how they interact, we can actually develop a very good features. One example would be for my work is like we had a lot of device information and they were important feature, but we saw that there was some interaction among the sizes of the devices. So instead of providing device sizes, if I put like big screen, small screen, or handheld, it was much more important, uh, important to the model. So these kind of things also helps you when you can actually interpret your model. And then the last thing is data acquisition. As a data scientist, I think it's one of our struggle to get more data. We are ne never happy with the data we have, right? We want more data. And data, get, getting data could be expensive and time consuming. And if you have facts backing it up, when you can show that this is your model, this is what it's doing, and if we can give this information, it could be better. Then it becomes a better case to present your data. So as a data scientist also, you need this from a technical perspective, right? And uh, stressing on the ethical obligation, I want to say like Cathy O'Neill in her like nice book, Weapons of Mass Destruction, if you haven't read it, please read it. She has said that models are nothing just like opinions embedded in mathematics, right? It's just math. So you have to be very careful when you are building model. And this would increase as machine learning is going to be used more and more into day-to-day -day life. So now we know it's very important, why it's important, right? This brings us to the question, why aren't we doing it already, right? Or why everybody is not doing it already, to be more precise. Uh, if you see traditionally, right, it's not that we are not doing anything. Traditionally, we have been using some kind of matrix, like if it's a simple model, we are using root, mean, square error, or abs absolute error, 
or like in case of classification or trees or anything, you are seeing the area under rock. So those kind of things just to identify how good it is to identify ones and zeros or like one class from the other class. And if you are working on something like clustering, you may be using Shillet score and just to see how each of them are identifying each, like they, how similar they are, right? But the problem with all of these things are they are very math heavy, right? And you being a data scientist or analyst, you have a background in it. But if you show it to a business or a user, they will not understand it because you have to, you, because we didn't understand it when we first saw it, right? We have to read it through. And the other problem is that these scores are calculated on a data which is at a particular point of time and data is never constant. And these things have, like, we, we try to minimize error on the data but you must have seen in your model that your performance slowly either it becomes constant or it starts going down. So these can't be the best. Like it could be for the performance, but it, it's not like the real performance of the model in the real world, right? So yeah. So to understand all of this, we need to take a step back and like get to know how machine learning works. So in a very simple scenario, what you do, you like you get your data, do your fancy stuff put into in the best fancy model possible, and boom, you have the prediction, right? And here the model in the simplest form is just a function. It's a mapping function for the input variable x, which produces your prediction y, with some error, because it can't be same as the real world, right? Because there will always be error. So you have some component of error. And this is what you try to minimize to get a better accuracy. And the problem here is this function, f of x, it could be like a really simple function, right? So it could be as simple as a linear model, which are very easy to interpret, right? It has weights and par to parameter, and you can interpret it very good and explain it to business. But because it has a bias, it's very high on bias, it, it has a low accuracy. Because in real world, not all the relationships are linear, right? Like if that would have been the case, life would have been easy. So we try to build a model which is a little more complicated, like a decision tree. Think of decision tree as human beings, right? You think you have option, you choose one, you move another. But the problem with decision tree is that they have high variance. So if you create a fully grown decision tree, right? The problem is they could overfit. So you will have like really good performance on your training data, but as soon as it goes into real world, it will perform badly. And because of this, we created a new set of machine learning models and sample models. They are really good, right? Now they are more efficient. They provide like pretty good prediction without overfitting. So they are a pretty good balance between bias and variance. But the problem is they are complex and there is like no way you can just interpret it by looking at it. Like your boosting algorithm could have 600 trees. And do you think you can parse all 600 to get to a decision? And then also it's like average or something. So it's, it's impossible. And then we were not happy with this, so we created this, right? Like deep learning. Nobody knows about it, everybody talks about it, right? So, so that's the thing. And it's like AI, AI, AI. And uh, so the, which brings us to the point is that if the model is simple, right? We can interpret it very easily. It's good, but the accuracy goes down because obviously and if the model becomes co more complex, we can see the interpret interpretability is a bit difficult or kind of impossible, but uh, accuracy is really good. We have seen that with ensemble model or neural networks. So there is always this trade-off between either you want to have very good result or you want to like yeah interpret your model, and we should not be doing that. So there have been a lot of methods proposed which can explain black box model, some of them are here, and but the problem with those were like it's not easy to understand how these all models relate to each other, and when one model should be used, or one method should be used over another, right? So the, then these two bright guys, Scott and Shunin Lee, I might have murdered his name pronunciation. I'm sorry, but uh, they came up with uh, an idea which was like, uh, they, ha they have a good paper on this. I would highly recommend you guys to read about that paper. I have a link at the end of the presentation. So what they said is like, all this method, they all basically, what they do is they are trying to create explain, uh, explanation model, which is 
a simple linear model, right? And they all have the same form. So they all create this simple linear model, which is a binary input. And we will see what this means, basically. And what they said is, like, because of this uniqueness in the approach, we can combine this all the methods. And with the help of game theory, which basically means that you assign credit to each feature depending upon their contribution to the model. And then they define a new class of method, which they termed as additive uh, feature attribution method, right? And this resulted into SHAP. So SHAP is basically uh, is kind of one single unique solution, which gives you a very linear model, which is easier to explain. And at the same time, it's accurate. And it, like for any interpretation model to work, it has to satisfy three property, the three natural property. And these are first is local accuracy. So if you have a model which predicts, and if you have an explanation model which predicts, for each prediction, those two predictions should be same, right? So it has to be locally accurate. And then the case is missingness. The, your explanation model is, is a very simple model, right? So what it does is that it turns off one feature and sees the impact on the model, what happens if I remove that feature. And this property means that removing the feature is as good as toggling it 0 and 1. So if you make the feature 0, it's as good as you're removing the feature. And the third point is consistency. So if removing a feature in one model has a bigger impact than another model, then that feature should be of a higher importance on the first model than to the second. I know this could be a bit math heavy. We will see the examples. That's why I would recommend that you read their paper. And there are some really good information out there. So I think it took me two or three times to read to fully understand this whole concept. So if you are still wondering what this guy is talking, don't worry. It happened with me. Yeah, but it's. It's a very good approach. And the good thing about, uh, so I talked a lot about how the inner working, right? But in a real world scenario, how does this work? So we saw the machine learning flow. You have your ML black box, you have the prediction, you have your data. So where does this Shapley things come in or SHAP comes in? It comes in here. What it does is that it builds explanation model, which is actually also a machine learning algorithm. But it's a much simpler algorithm, which is it's a linear algorithm, which works on binary inputs. And you input it, the data set, and your model prediction. And what does this explanation model does is that it, you ha it gets the prediction, it gets the data. So f what it will do is for each feature and prediction combination, it will remove one of the feature and see how much impact does it have on the prediction. And it will do for all the rows. And then it can have an uh, average effect of that feature on the model prediction. So that way, identify which features are important and which are not. And we would see that in code. And I think that would make it more clear on how it does it, right? So then you get the explanation and you go this. And the good thing about SAP is basically it's post hoc, so you build your model, and then you try to interpret it. So it's not like you're in trying to interpret it before. There are techniques where you can do it before, but it doesn't make sense, right? You want to do it post hoc, not ad hoc. And then uh, the other thing is it's model agnostic. So it doesn't matter which model you have. It can interpret all of them. So you don't have to custom your code as per what model you're using. It's just you can be used for both. and. Uh, most important, it has both local and global interpretation. What, I, what do I mean by it is this. So you see in this graph, there is like, so you want to see how feature is affecting your model globally, right? Like, what's the important overall in the prediction? But at the same time, you just want to know about how a single individual prediction is made. So if I'm saying a churn, uh, this customer is going to churn, I want to see why the model thought this customer would churn and not I just don't want the feature importance because the feature importance doesn't tell me the direction of the impact, whether it's a positive or a negative impact, right? So SAP provides where you can see the overall impact of the model and at the same time you can see it locally where you can see an individual prediction and see what are the features which impacted the model to make those decisions. Yeah. Time to see something in code, so I think it will be better for everybody to understand. 
Uh, you can't see my screen, audio. Oh, wait, I might have to. Yeah, much better. So I'm going to talk about the SAP package which we have in Python. So it depends what's, what installation of Python you are using. If you are using Anaconda, you can get it from Conda Forge. If you're a normal Python, you can get it from pip. The only thing with Anaconda is that uh, you might get the updates a bit late because Anaconda takes its time to add some features later. So you might have a little like a, one old version or something, but it's, it's available at both the places. So here what I'm trying to showcase is like we have the census data where, where we have the information about a person, and we are trying to predict whether they will earn more than 50k a year or less than 50k a year, right? So uh, let's like the usual stuff: get numfi, pandas, and and everything. And it should not take that much time. Yeah. And this is the data set we have, and this is a public data set, so you can like actually download it and play with it just to see how it behaves with you. So you have a lot of features like age, work class, education, marital status. So it has features, a uh, lot of them. And this is where I'm trying to get it from them. And just to show you how the data looks, right? The good thing about, because it's, it's a demo, I wanted to get a data set which has like numerical. Otherwise, I'm not going to talk about all the feature engineering part or the machine learning, because my focus is just how it explains. So this is how the data looks. Everything looks nice. And then it has a one with a categorical, so you can map out how what value means what. Doing the so what we are trying to do here is like create a test and training set. So 80% of our data would be we will be using for training and 20% for the testing set. Yeah, so you can see we have 12 features and what are the, the number of columns and everything. And what I am trying to use here, I have already put up some parameters. Did some not very great hyperparameter, but did some. Didn't want to do it because it will take so much time. So I'm using light GBM. You must be aware of light GBM, right? It's it's a boosting algorithm developed by Microsoft, which which is very efficient and it works on binning and everything. So it's a because boosting algorithm have been known for being really slow and everything, but light GBM is quite fast. But it's complex, right? You it's. If somebody asks you to interpret a light GBM model, I can understand how you feel about it. So let's try to train the model. Yeah, two seconds. In real world, never happens, but yeah. So you have the model. Let's try to make the predictions. So we have accuracy of 86 rate, right, which is not bad. Let's take a look at the classification model report. Seems pretty good. And the confusion matrix. Like usually, you do this: you plot the accuracy, you see the classification, and you have the confusion matrix. And like, yeah, you. Uh, I'm gonna plot it for you, so just to see like how many of them we are we are able to classify it correctly. So it's not bad actually. But I mean, this if you show this to a user, they would say, okay, I know you classified these ten correctly, but how? That's the agenda of our whole discussion here that we want to know how it did it. So then comes SAP, which is, yeah, it will, uh, it has different method. The good thing about SAP is like, as I told you, it's model agnostic. So you can use any model on top of it, but then it provides some like really fast implementation for tree explainer. It also has something for deep explainer, which is for new uh, TensorFlow and all those stuff. So either you use kernel explainer if you don't find it has anything, but they have a tree explainer for light GBM or XGBoost or any of the scikit-learn trees. So let's use that because that will be faster than your kernel explainer. So what we are trying to do here is like we pass our model as we see saw in the picture if you remember, right? You pass the model through the tree explainer and then you also at the same time you put the test data through it. So it, it, have, it has both, right? It has the prediction, 
and it has the data and then it, it what it does is that it switches off one feature sees its impact on the model of the prediction and th it keeps on doing this for all the feature for all the prediction and then it average out the impact of that feature and that is called shapley value or shap so shap is just the average impact of the model over like throughout the prediction so what we will do, this might take some time. I should have run it before. I didn't think it through. But yeah. So let it run. Usually in a real world, it will take a lot longer time. Here still, it will be faster because it's not only trying to run an algorithm, it's doing it for a lot of combination, right? So it will be a bit slower. So be ready for it, so don't expect it to give you output very fast. But for us, it should not take that much time. And here I have just taken like first 2,000 records, if you see here, right? So I've taken first 2,000 records to check it, because if I run it for all the 26,000, we would be sitting here for some time then, which I don't want you to do. Yeah. Come on, come on. Hmm. Yeah, this is much more than I was expecting. But don't worry, if it doesn't run, I have a backup also, so. Yeah, it ran. It was just waiting for me to tell the backup plan. Uh, so basically what it generates, it, it generates this Shapley value, right? So on the column, you have the different features and the rows are basically each record on the data. So it generates those values. So it generates for each feature what was the impact on that prediction. So if you see here, so for feature zero, this was the impact it had on that prediction. And uh, we will see it in graphs, so it's easier to understand. But I just wanted to show you like the usual. So a usual way for anybody would be to see a feature importance, right? where you see age is very important, relationship is very important. But one thing which I don't like about feature importance is that it just tells you it's important. It doesn't tell you how it is important. Like, is it positive? Is it negative? Like, is it making the prediction go higher or go lower? So it just tells you it's important. But how? It doesn't. And then comes the good part about Shapley. It has this summary plot. This one is nice. Yeah. So just to explain you that, right? It plots all the feature from their importance. So you see age is the most important, country least important. And the zero is the zero is the base value, which is basically the average prediction of the model across all prediction. But it's not zero, so the base value it moves it to zero. And anything which it thinks will earn more than 50k, it moves it to the positive side. And anything which it thinks will be less than, it moves it to the negative side. I'm making sense, right? Yeah. And then the color coding, right? The color coding means what's the value of that feature. So red means that feature has a higher value, as in value, as in value. Like th 60 is a high, 20 is a low that kind of value. So if you see on the top, right, we can see that age, the red part, which is basically has a positive impact on the prediction. So if, if you are on like a little older, it model tends to think you're going to earn more, which makes sense kind of, right? You have more experience, you're going to earn, earn more. And then for relationship, because it's a categorical variable, we see some of the red, but it's not very easy to identify from this graph, but we have other graphs where we can see categorical variable also. But one good thing about this is, right, you see capital gain. It's not at the top of your feature importance, but when it's important, it, it has a huge impact because you see the red point here. The impact it has is much bigger than uh, on age. So, but what the thing is, age has impact on a lot of prediction. Even though small impact, it has impact on a lot of prediction. That's why it's on the top. But capital gain has impact on few features, but when it impacts, it has a huge impact. 
So, I mean, these kind of insight, it's not easy to get from accuracy or matrix, right? So it gives you a very good high level overview of stuff. Uh, going to, and then you can actually see how age has been, like if you just want to see for a single. So that what we saw, right? Like if you are younger, you have less impact on the model. If you grow older, you tend to earn more. And uh, if you just don't want to see for one feature, you can even see for two features. So here we can see like those people who are widowed and old, they have, so here the share value is on the left hand side. So you see as the model thinks if you are old and widow, you tend to earn less. That is what is saying, saying because these are negative values, right? So you can see how one feature interacts with another, not just a single feature. So yeah, and uh, then we talked about looking at uh, individual prediction. So this is one individual prediction where it decide how. So you have to see the size of each block. So here we see the blue block is bigger, which means it's going to the lower value, means earn, they will earn less. So they, because he is a young, never married, and not in family, so it thinks that, OK, uh, this person were not gonna. So you can actually see even for individual predictions, right? Uh, yep, yeah. and I think uh, my code took some more time to run, so I might have to change the, this part here. But just want to show you, you can have a very high level overview of how your model is making decisions. So red ones are the positive, blue ones are the negative, right? So. Why the yeah, can we see? No duplicate. Wait. Yeah, nice. Okay, so we all agree with this, right? Black box models are not cool, interpreter models are very cool. And uh, basically to quickly recap, build trust in your model, have ethical obligation towards it. There, you have to find a balance between interpretability and accuracy. We know the scope of the, like it has to be locally and globally. SAP, go and look up SAP, what it is, read about it, it's very good. I would recommend you go and learn about this stuff. There is so much to learn. These are some of the take pictures of it. These are like really good resources where you can read about it. And uh, yeah, I would leave you with this thought. If you can't explain it, you don't understand it. So yeah, that's all. If you have any questions, feel free to. I will put up the recap slide so that we know you what you covered. Uh, sorry, what simple question. If you compare the feature importance of the SHAP model with the feature importance of the decision tree, for example, I found out that so often they are not the same. The, the order is not... The because in decision tree, it could be based on different method, right? So it could be based on gain, or it could be based on, well, it, the feature importance could be based on Gini or entropy. So it depends upon what you choose. So if you update this parameter, I, I went through this. So if you update this parameter, they would match. So it depends upon how your feature importance is pl plotted. Thank you. I have a question regarding uh, the nature of every item in your data set. Let's say that you are building a model to uh, diagnose a disease based on X-ray images. Um, I'm wondering about the diversity of the samples. Would you expect all of the data set to be X-ray pictures some of them showing the disease and, sh and some of them not showing it, or something like a picture of your room would be even even wor uh, worth have it in your data set. Uh, 
I don't know if you understand my question. Yeah, no, actually. Like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, let's say, let's say, is is all your data set, even your, let's say, in, in, uh, dividing uh, the samples in true or false? Yeah. Are the false items uh, expected to be related to the model that you want to predict? Ah, I still don't know what I understood, but like even if if a model makes a prediction that it's not what you want it to be, it you can see from the explanation why it chose to. And like I I I didn't show in the example. Even if you are working with an image, right, going it through a deep learning network, you can see actually see which part of the image the model took to decide the prediction. So SAP has that feature also. So if, if that's what you ask. So if you have an image, if the model thought it's not what you want it to be, then it will tell you like what part of the image it read and what it thought about it. So you, if that's, yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah. Um, thanks for a good talk. Uh, very interesting and important stuff. Um, I have a question about the um, uh, model um, like agnostic model thing. agnostic yeah yeah model ag agnostic um, that would mean to me that uh, this uh, module doesn't uh, have support for all these individual in individual models but rather that it doesn't even know about what it's uh, what the model is uh, how can it in fact um, be uh, like explain all these different models without knowing about what they are um, do the models actually store in some unified way the, the feature importance and, and so on? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I will try to give you a short answer, yeah, but that will take, <laughs> we can discuss the yeah, long answer later. It doesn't worry about the model, right? It, it works on the game theory where you just, instead of going through the whole model, it sees you feed this data to model, this is what it predicts. And if you switch it out, this is what it predicts. So it, it's not trying to predict how the, like, it's trying to predict how the model is taking the importance of all these features. So it doesn't matter how it does it inside. It's just telling you, like, okay, this feature seems to be important for this model. This is what we are seeing. It's not actually showing us the path of it. So it's 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 more about how much each feature contribute towards model. So it then the model could be abstract, right? So it still works without knowing exact internal working of the model. But then you have some stuff which is made to work faster with this model, and like for Xeboost and all the stuff. So that's why it's you don't have to worry about because it's it's about the features and the prediction yeah and we uh, let's discuss it I, I have like a pretty long explanation for that but yeah i'm already running out of yeah overshoot the time yeah so if anyone has any more questions you can talk to him in the lunch and that will be all and thank you ravi for uh, thank you wonderful